cytoplasm, all the organelles, all the things that you would expect in an ordinary cell body. Now, <clears throat> if you think back about what we said about the definition of axons and dendrites in the case of the motor neuron, we can now apply these names to the sensory neuron. Remember we said a dendrite is any fibre which carries impulses towards the cell body. And in the case of the motor neuron, the dendrites were short. But if we apply the same definition to the sensory neuron, that of a dendrite being anything which carries information towards the cell body, then the whole length of this must be the dendrite. So this is the dendrite carrying information from the periphery towards the cell body. That's why it's referred to as the dendrite. Remember the definition of an axon? An axon is anything which carries information from the cell body away. So a dendrite is carrying information to the cell body an axon is carrying information away from the cell body, therefore this is the axon. In the case of a sensory neuron. Now just like the motor neuron, the sensory neuron is covered with a myelin sheath that protects, insulates, and nourishes. Again, the myelin sheath is made up of Schwann cells, just as in the motor neuron. Schwann cells which are wrapped around about the axon to comprise the myelin sheath. So just as in the motor neuron, Schwann cells comprising the myelin sheath. Just as in the motor neuron, gaps between the myelin sheath. The gaps are referred to as the nodes of Rambia, just as they are in the motor neuron. So very many of the components are the same. And the key thing with the neuron is to remember the direction that the impulse is transmitted in. Now we said the impulse is generated in the periphery. It's then carried in this direction along the dendrite towards the central nervous system. It actually goes into the cell body sometimes here, then back out and on towards the central nervous system. So the dendrite carrying the impulse towards the cell body, the axon carrying it away from the cell body. The other major components the same as in the motor neuron. Now just before we uh, pass on from these diagrams, there's another important point to note, and it relates again to the function of the myelin sheath. Now, to make the impulses travel more quickly along the nervous impulse, the nerve impulse does not travel along the full length of the neuron, but what it does is it actually jumps from one node of Ramvia to the next. It's a little hard to understand this process. It's a little bit like when you skim a stone across the top of some water and it skips like that. The impulse skips from one node of Rambia to the next. 
and this greatly increases the rate at which the nerve impulse is transmitted. The process of this jumping conduction is referred to as saltatory conduction. saltatory conduction or saltatory transmission. Now we can note at this point that there's two factors that determine how quickly a nerve impulse is transmitted in a nerve fibre. The first factor is the diameter of the nerve fibre. The wider the diameter of the fibre, the faster the nerve impulse is transmitted. The more narrow the diameter of the fibre, the more slowly the nerve impulse is transmitted. And some uh, animals, for example the squid, have very, very wide diameter axons to facilitate their escape response when they sort of swoosh to get away from things. Very wide axons so the impulse is transmitted very quickly. But no matter how wide you make the axon, well you can't make it that wide for practical reasons, but no matter how wide the axon is, the rate of transmission is not as fast as if the nerve fibre is myelinated. Because when the nerve fibre is myelinated, saltatory conduction can take place and nerve transmission is much, much quicker. So the second factor which affects the rate of transmission after the diameter is whether that fibre is myelinated or not. Myelinated fibres transmit nerve impulses much more quickly because they use the process of saltatory transmission. Now, Let's uh, think about this neuron now, which we haven't mentioned yet, and uh, we'll refer to this as a relay neuron. Because we're going to assume that what we're going to look at now is, is a reflex arc. We'll assume this is part of a reflex arc. Now let's think about what we mean by this term reflex. If you touch something hot or sharp you pull your hand away quickly. Or if you're walking along and one leg gives way because you twist your ankle or something, the other leg automatically straightens up so you don't fall over. These are things that protect the body from damage that we don't think about. They are reflexes. We just do them. We become aware of them only after the reflex activity has been carried out. This is because, in physiological terms, a structure called a reflex arc has been used. And what we're going to do now is look at what we mean by this term reflex arc. A reflex arc. And this is a, a useful exercise because what it does is it combines what we know about the sensory neuron and the motor neuron and it puts them together to form a reflex arc. Now let's imagine you touch something very hot and you burn your fingers. What sort of neuron is going to carry that information towards the central nervous system? Well, that information will be picked up in a peripheral sensory receptor. So we can start off by drawing some peripheral sensory receptors. And they join together to form a sensory neuron. So the next thing we can draw is the 